it's not to take any the Holocaust lightly or anything, but I really do feel that corporations, you know, use very powerful propaganda to shape our minds, just like fascist governments have done, mm. uh, and have very um, extremely deleterious. I mean, uh, ecocidal and genocidal uh, yeah. impacts on the world. So it's I'm making a very serious point of this. Yeah, I mean some some of some corporations, as you probably know, like Monsanto and Bayer, is it Bayer Munich and Volkswagen, have links going back to Nazi yeah. times and and are, are still benefiting from what happened. So yeah. Um, some American companies and it's like I mean I think it's um oh Noam Chomsky who calls corporations corporate totalitarianism you know right yeah yeah so yeah and like the, the posters in the store are these sort of like communist iconography with like the big the big faces uh you know the the sort of brainwashing slogans being yeah. to be you know like these sort of ridiculous corporate slogans that don't mean anything but if you repeat them often enough you'll start to believe yeah that, so. sure sure okay so um on a similar like taking this a bit further um so one of the main characters who plays a woman of indian origin criticizes one of the white employees um for assuming that she likes bollywood music but then mm-hmm. it turns out she does like a bit of bollywood music but she felt like she had to sort of call that out and, and so there's this kind of theme of political correctness and it mm-hmm. seems you strike you strike a good balance in the film between like genuinely provo- promoting diversity in the cast, but also showing the superficiality of kind of corporate diversity, mm-hmm. um, especially in an industry like fast fashion, when the producers of the materials are, you know, like in India and Bangladesh and other places, you know, often in the global south and are being treated like shit. So um yeah, I mean, I had this question, were you aware of all this from the start of the film writing process? But you've kind of already answered that because this was all this was all in the documentary that you watched. I started to do research before in that second draft that I wrote. I had really started to do research. I did a lot of image research. Um, and so I knew a lot of, you know, I've I've seen documentaries about Monsanto and BT Cotton and all that. So even before watching the true cost, I already had that, I, that uh, I already knew about the corporate hypocrisy, but, yeah. but that documentary just cemented everything. Sure. Okay. Um, towards the start of what I perceive to be the second act of the film, like if, if, if the first act ends with the carnage in the women's toilets, mm-hmm. um, there's a there's a parody of a promotional video about the so-called ethically sourced and organic material used by Canadian cotier, cotton clothiers. Mm-hmm. I find that really funny. That's like a really great part of the film. And there's also a scene where a senior employee admits that they don't really know about the supply chains that feed. They don't actually know where the material comes from. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if people watching realise, but this is that's not... That's not an exaggeration. Some com- some companies don't actually know where their materials will come from. This is absolutely sho- shocking. Um, well, and- I think they know. They know, but they don't know. They pretend they don't know. So they 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 pawn off responsibility on subcontractors, knowing full well okay. that that it's coming from unethical places, but pretending that oh, oops, we didn't realize. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Right, right. Or, or or maybe there are some things they could know, but they choose not to find out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, I, again, this question, I feel like you've kind of already answered it, but the, it was like, how prominent was the climate and ecological crisis in your mind during the whole process of writing and directing Slacks? Because I know, I know when you uh, got involved in Extinction Rebellion, um helped start the group in Montreal and then got involved in other activism I guess a large part of the film 
writing and directing and 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 re- and distributing that had all kind of happened already a lot of that hadn't it yeah so yeah so it wasn't i mean i i've been aware of corporate evil for a very very long time and it's been very much a concern of mine so that was and i knew you know like a lot of us knew there something wasn't isn't quite right there's something not quite right but it hadn't gelled in my mind until the fall of 2018 like how much trouble we were in and at that point slacks had already been written we had already been financed and i was getting ready to shoot it in the winter of 2019 so that was not for a a driving factor in my creation of slacks but the corporate hypocrisy corporate misdeeds you know just not giving a shit about people in the environment that was very much a part of the the creative process of the writing yeah process. yeah of course okay um so in one part of the film where we have a view of a corridor with a body with body parts like real body parts stuffed into a bin mm-hmm. and then and then the camera draws back I don't know if you remember, you probably do remember this, but then the camera draws back to reveal and like an adjacent bin with mannequin, mannequin parts stuffed into it. And it Mm -hmm. seems like this wasn't purely aesthetic. It seems like it was a comment on the fakeness of the fashion industry and like the expendability of human beings and bodies. Was, Was that what that was about? Yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, that's like the, there's a lot of shots of mannequins because I find mannequins are so creepy. Yeah. Um, but also I do find that there's a similarity with what the fast fashion makeup industry is doing to people where they have, they think they have to, to become these sort of plastic figures in order to be accepted, yeah. especially women. Um, mm. and that is part of slacks because, you know, they're called the super shapers and you make your butt look great. Um, and so for sure that was, that was a sort of visual trope, the mannequins, yeah. And how people are turning themselves into mannequins and becoming sort of plastic beings because of what yeah. these corporations are brainwashing them to do, to think. Sure, sure. Okay. Um, it turns out that the killer genes are possessed by the spirit of a 13-year-old cotton picker named Kirat, who fell into a kind of threshing machine in India. Um does the number 13 mean anything significant to you? 13? No, why? I just wondered because it's it's like my favorite number for for ah. because it's because it, it's a number that's all, always supposed to be unlucky. Yeah. Um but I did a bit of research and the research suggests that the reason 13 became unlucky is because it's a very feminine number because there are 13 moon cycles in a year. So you've got 12, oh. 12 months, but 13 moon cycles. Hmm. Um, and there's this idea that men basically have to, to, to want to kind of oppress the feminine principle and oppress women. They made 13 into an unlucky number. It's, it's a theory. I don't know if that's right. This is, I think this is a theory I kind of came up with, but the, I think I researched there might be some truth to it. I'm not sure, but, and 13 seems to feature in some horror, horror movies like Friday, uh, the, Friday 13th. the 13th. Yeah. <laughs> so I, no, I, 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 was, I just wondered. Yeah. I thought it was the apostles plus Judas. So it was Whoa. the thirteen was unlucky because Judas was the thirteenth apostle, but he was the oh traitor. really oh yeah. I've never heard that okay okay that's what well I, may, that's maybe maybe it could be maybe it could be both I don't know but yeah your yeah your theory sounds more your that sounds more convincing what you said um, yeah I just because in the film I think Kirat or the ghost or the spirit kind of writes. Doesn't she write 13 on the wall because they ask how old she is or something? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's in blood, so. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's cool. I like it. Um, it's really good as well that literally no one in the film is spared from the from the, from the the rage, the rage of the killer pants. 
um, not even the general public who who are not working for the company. Um, so this really feels like a, uh, like a, an obvious message um, and like a, a victory for the rights of oppressed workers, I guess. Um, it seems, and it seems retrospectively like Kirat is kind of the main protagonist in the film, mm -hmm. e even though she's not sort of obviously present. Um, this is kind of just me talking about my interpretation instead of interviewing you a lot of the no, times. No, no, that's, that is true. That is. I mean, it's yeah. the it's a slasher movie, so usually the there's like the final girl, but the 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 slasher is sort of the not the hero, but is the protagonist in a way. So for sure, for me, Kirat is. I mean, Libby, I guess, is the protagonist, is the one that we identify with. But to me, right. my favorite character was always the pants. Yeah, great, fantastic. So you've kind of played, you've you've played around a bit with like the traditional structure of uh, film narrative, I guess, because you usually there is someone left at the. Well, I guess nowadays there's been a few films along the slacks kind of. Uh, along that kind of model but most most films you expect someone to survive at the end don't you mm. um I mean, now it's changed i think now it's, okay. it's hard to to predict certainly it's set up that you think libby because she's so nice and cute, yeah she's gonna survive and in the first draft of the new iteration she did survive with truti they both escaped but then patricia oh. was like no, they can't. She has to die. It was, <laughs> yeah. it was her idea to make her get trampled to death. I mean, spoiler alert, right? To, by the by yeah. the crowds, the Black Friday crowds at the end. And I, when she suggested it, I was like, yes, of course. She has to be yeah. trampled to death. So no, I didn't want, and I, I didn't want anyone, when that became apparent that it had to be the end, I was like, no one can escape because it's not a happy ending. We don't want to close the door and be like, oh, they escaped. Yeah. It's like, no, no one's innocent and no one should be immune. Exactly. To that. Yeah, nobody's innocent. But yeah, no, I think that's really great. Um, so okay, are there any sort of um things that you want to tell the audience about slacks which we're not aware of or that I haven't asked you about? <laughs> um no, I mean aside from the the one thing that people don't ever guess is the fascist iconography so that one right. was like yeah i was glad to get that one out there um, cool excellent i mean not really if, i think t for me i like people to watch the film and make their own interpretation yeah. okay you know, um i don't know what else i could say it's it's a movie about killer fans it sort of yeah. says, it, it says <laughs> it all but yeah. it is look it's it's easy for me to to make a film by killer pants and then i know people sometimes like i'm in morocco right now and secondhand clothing here is super expensive so people right. buy you know they buy first-hand stuff even secondhand stuff so i can't be telling people you you must buy just secondhand stuff you can't yeah. buy new stuff it's it's, sure. it's hard i get it people sometimes can't afford anything but fast fashion but i think what i want people to take away is like how much we consume is abnormal yeah. like having been living here in the south of morocco where people consume very 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 little like i'm shocked how little things people have sometimes it's because of of their economic situation but some it's sometimes it's i mean huge houses and they just have very little stuff so yeah. they're not brought up in that consumerist lifestyle um and so right. yeah just right. to, to think about your desire to shop and to consume is it really coming from you or is it coming from you know brainwashing practices um brought brought about by corporations basically to make you want newer and newer, and newer things all the time and yeah to make you desire to make you get that little hit from yeah um, purchasing so i think we do have to re-examine our consuming choices and our consuming pat consumption patterns in occidental society 
Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, moving on from Slacks in particular, can I ask, can I ask how did you first get into filmmaking? What was the study path or the learning path like? Was it a kind of was it a kind of standard studying film pro process, or did you kind of fall into it accidentally? Or no, no, I wanted to make films since I was ten. So oh, I, okay. Yeah, I always really. I became obsessed when I was young with Back to the Future and Star Wars. Yeah. I watched these two films <laughs> obsessively. And I knew I liked writing little stories and I just knew I wanted to make film. I knew I wanted to be an artist since I was really young. And I just, at around 10, I was like, I want to make films. So I taught myself screenwriting when I was like 15. Wow. Uh, and then I went to college. I studied film, right, film producing production and okay. screenwriting and then I came out of school and I got work on American film productions shooting in Canada and I started making my own indie films on the side um, and then yeah finally you know after many 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 years of doing things on my own out of the system you know finally slacks it became apparent that there was something there that people liked so we were fortunate enough to finally be able to like pierce through the like indie indie door and um and get proper financing but it was a it was you know over 20 year road to get there so okay even though okay. i started when i was really young i didn't get to slacks until you know my mid mid 40s sure sure well i'm sure there's much more to come anyway um so have you got anything to say about the environmental impact of the film industry yeah yeah i mean it's, it's not it's not great um i'm on the directors guild of canada's national sustainability and climate action committee so i've been on it for about two years um so i've learned a lot about the impact of the filmmaking industry i mean it's it was apparent to me when that something wasn't quite right when i was working on those big american productions when there was like 12 suvs you know lined up in the parking lot um and everyone had to have an suv because if your car wasn't as big as the next guy's car or the next woman's car well no it was mostly men back then yeah you, know, you weren't important your dick wasn't as big so god forbid yeah. it um and just the waste you know even but i participated in it because in film if you're not rapid and you're not turning things around super quickly you know you get fired so it doesn't it's not conducive to good environmental practices but it's starting i mean way way too late obviously as everything is way too late um so i mean yeah film is very polluting because a lot of there's a lot of transportation there's a lot of diesel generators there's a lot of flights there's a lot of art department um waste there's a lot of food waste but the film industry is i know from being on this committee is making a concerted effort really to to educate its members and to try to turn things around um too little too late obviously but still they're still they're making an effort <laughs> yeah um, <laughs> that's good so I, love that. I know I'm, I'm very cynical but but then again i forget i can forget like when we made slacks i again i didn't really i had just started xr so we didn't do anything eco friendly yeah. like the DGC gave me a little recycle, uh, reusable coffee mug, and I felt really, really pleased with myself. Yeah. Um, so for sure, in the next one, my producer, I've already told my producers, like, we have to make this as sustainable as possible. That's the slogan, the DGC slogan, because filmmaking by nature is insane. And, and it's not that by nature wasteful, but you're creating a fake world, like, it's really hard not to waste in a way. And Canada yeah. is so fast. So we have to drive so much to just, and even electric cars. I mean, yes, we all know the uh, uh, contra, that's not controversy, but like people pat themselves on the back being like, it's okay. We switched to electric cars and really it's yeah. the production of it. It's the shipping of it. That's the problem. Yeah. 
mm. the batteries, shit, you know, yeah, mind in horrible conditions and blah blah blah. Mm. Yeah. So I don't know what the answer to that is. It's no, that's like, okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for exposing that. Anyway, yeah. Um, and film streaming. Look, server farms. Right. Use, like we're better off watching VHS tapes. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. People have this idea that online stuff is somehow has a really low environmental impact, but that's not always true at all. No, it's not true at all, actually. No. Like ebooks, like, uh, you know, ebooks instead of carbon copy books, they're not, they're not necessarily, from what I understand, lo lower environmental impact. But I don't know. I'm not sure. But, um, I mean, I think if you buy yeah. a second hand book in your local bookstore, yeah or if you go to the library but, but i don't know again i'm not i really don't yeah. know the details so i can't speak to them this is something i should look at, actually anyway um yeah so moving on i had this idea of as i've been talking to you about activist horror or horror activism alternatively as a potential genre or classification of both art and activism which includes or any art or activism which includes horrific or disturbing imagery or, or horrific or disturbing elements in order to shock the audience into doing something mm -hmm. or into behave into behaving responsibly i guess um on any given cause whether that be climate climate or, or anything else mm -hmm. um do, do you think that's a useful concept uh I mean, I think that's been happening in art. Like, I think some artists use their platform to speak to certain topics. Yeah. So you could already be, you know, I think that's already been happening. Um, I can't. Yeah, probably for thousands of years, actually. It's, it's probably been a strain of, of not, art. Not, no, not thousands of years. I don't think people have been... Hundreds? Yeah. yeah probably i would like i don't know much about I'm, I'm not a huge art history uh yeah encyclopedia no. but, <laughs> but what about what about the horror film industry like can you think of any can you think of any horror films which Okay, so they might they might not be focused on just on social justice or environmental justice, but any horror films like from the past, which could be kind of seen as a crit a critique of oh for sure like, like George Romero, Romero films yeah, yeah for I was sure. just I just Night thought of the Living Dead and um, uh, John Carpenter like they live oh. he's very criti critical critical. Um, mm. Night of the Living Dead, Return of the Dead, or which one is in the mall? There's I don't one know like which one it is. Yeah. Day, of the no Day of the Dead or Dawn of the Dead. That's definitely yeah. a criticism of consumer society. Um, I mean, sure, that I think Night of the Living Dead is the example that jumps to my mind. Um, yeah, what did you say about John? I've heard of John Carpenter, but I didn't hear the film that you said. Oh, it's called They Live. It's brilliant. They Live. They yeah, live. yeah, yeah, it's okay. great. It's a really underrated horror film. It's, is it even a horror film? I'm not sure. It's about a society. It's, it's set in the 80s, and it's about a, a dude, like a homeless guy or sort of a drifter who finds shelter in sort of the outskirts of LA and he comes to get to know this this group I don't know if they belong to a church that runs a shelter or something but that have uncovered an alien plan to brainwash society and the only way you can become aware of it is to put on some sunglasses and when you put ah, on sunglasses you course. see <laughs> the aliens so it's like they're they're dressed you know in in without the sunglasses they look like humans when we put the sunglasses on they look like these these cheesy aliens but the most okay. important thing is that all the advertising has subliminal messages like consume or oh, yeah. uh, you know don't question authority or so but if right, you put right. the sunglasses on you read the subliminal messages oh so it's really, wow really great it's really fun yeah. I mean, it's pretty simple, but it's it's quite effective. 
Okay, I'd love to try that out. Can you, going by the, def, the sort of definition of horror activism that I've just given, can you think of any past activist, uh, any actions that you have been involved with or seen, whether it's been Extinction Rebellion or another group, which have involved any kind of horrific or scary imagery in order to sort of impress people with the urgency of the climate crisis? Um, not horrific. No, actually, I tended to use satire because I think okay. humor is actually quite powerful to get people to think because they're yeah. disarmed by the humor. Yeah. And so my my uh, I got to know a a friend, or a woman who became a friend, and the the actions we did were satirical in, in just like slacks, where it was quite disturbing because we were being satirical. Um, it, and can you? There's like my. It's my okay. It's back, okay. But um. So and some some were we did actually the one that we did that was the best was it was called the Kool Aid Die In, okay. where it was my friend, her husband, and her teenage daughter were like a cult cult members, and they gave Kool Aid type drinks to the crowd. And each each flavor was a climate denial emotion. And so okay. the, the crowd would drink the Kool-Aid and at one point they all dropped dead, like the Jonestown massacre. Okay. Yeah, that I think that qualifies. So I would say that was yeah. the most disturbing yeah. action yeah. we did. <laughs> but what about but there's also I wanted been to do more disturbing stuff. Yeah. But there's also been a, there's, there's been like like XR have done a lot of actions with fake blood, right? You know, like throwing yeah. fake blood, which is kind of a horror sort of thing. But um, I don't think that's we sounds... did fake blood. I did a, a, a car, a plane crash. We did one called Flight to Extinction, where it was like you were okay. on a plane and yeah. you were going towards extinction. And that was the, the, the flight attendant sort of explaining the procedures of the plane, but as if you were going towards your death. Yeah. <laughs> That's it was good. very humorous it was like, yeah it was uh i think those were the most successful ones where it was this sort of dark humor yeah disturbing dark humor because it's not so in your face mm. you're like oh, i'm laughing but this is horrible yeah i think maybe i i need i need to think of a different term instead of horror activism because like because what you've just described does does kind of qualify to to the kind of thing i'm including in this idea but yeah um okay will you be doing will you be making any more films with with kind of strong with strong environmental messages and so what film are you working on at the moment can you tell can you tell the audience what film you are working on at the moment and also yeah. and also will you be doing any more films with an environmental message well, I have projects that I hope to be made, but it's always really hard to know whether your films will get financed. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I have two with very strong messages. Uh, one is is set in the mining industry in oh. Quebec. And that's actually a limited series um, called Light of the Pendulum. And it's about how we've become dissociated from the earth and the earth's power. And in order to reestablish the balance, we need to sacrifice a part of ourselves um, to become realigned with, with nature again so we don't overstep our boundaries while we've already, we already have. But so we, we get back into alignment with the earth and can avoid a greater catastrophe. Um, and then I have another TV show called Global Terror Inc. And it's about youth activists who have become like eco terrorists terrorists and so they they each episode is about punishing a certain villain like an eco villain um with with fun and dis disturbing ways um yeah. and then of course it builds up to like a bigger a bigger plan and then we, we find out who they're targeting and why and um so that one's definitely like a climate crisis project uh because there's a, a psychologist called glenn albrecht i think from australia who coined 
certain new emotional states linked to the climate and ecological crisis and one is global, okay. global well, it's called global dread but in french oh. it's 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 translated into terror global and i loved oh, wow. i was like global terror oh my god that sounds so great so yeah so will i get to ever produce them i don't know right okay but yes i definitely have those two those two i'm working on Great, fantastic. Yeah, the second one you've told me about before, and it sounds really exciting. Well, they both sound exciting, but um, the second one particularly, I can see that on running on Netflix yeah. sometime soon. And yeah. it's very satirical. I mean, the tone yeah. is extremely, extremely satirical and sort of like over the top. So it's, it's aligned quite aligned with slacks. Yeah, I guess some people, some people might be a, a little bit hesitant. Um, to engage with it because the you know the word eco terrorism, but um, if they see if they understand the satire and and the urgency yeah. of the time times we're living in as well, and they should go for it really. Yeah, um, I mean people are being killed by yeah. the climate and ecological crisis. So to me, it's yeah. just about like who is the greater villain? Is it these kids who are trying to defend themselves and call attention to the fact that? these uber corporate magnets don't give a shit and have like rockets yeah. to escape <laughs> yeah have you... or is it these who like who is really the global terrorists that is the question yeah. that the show is is ultimately asking 